You're listening to the All In Podcast with your hosts, Shane and Blake, giving you a new perspective on the dental industry. Are you ready to go all in? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Welcome to the All In Podcast, the podcast that brings you a new and a different perspective on the dental industry. I'm your host, Shane McElroy. And listen, I've got your texts, I've got your messages on Instagram and LinkedIn and some other stuff. I know, it's been a while, guys and gals, and I apologize for that. Uh, what's even worse is that I believe like 10 episodes ago, I did say it was on content creation. I think I talked about how important it was to be consistently delivering content. And then guess what I do? I take two months off. So the hypocrisy of it all, right? Do as I say, not as I do. Well, not really do whatever you want. But but the reality is, folks, listen, it's I'll be honest with you. I've been in a little mental slump over the last, you know, January and February and just coming out of it and being busting my butt with work, which by the way, is going very well. Uh, thanks for asking. But yeah, it, it's I'm getting the bug again, really kind of want to get to recording some more episodes. And, and guess what, guys and ga- gals again, I'm always bad about that. Uh, Blake, might be joining us for some more episodes. I know he said he's walked away for good, but I told you I changed his mind and guess what I did. So you'll have some episodes with him. Not this one, not this one, because we want this one to be good. Uh, but some of the later episodes, you'll see Blake's going to be joining the podcast again. I'm excited to have my buddy back. Uh, we always have interesting conversations, but uh, yeah, it's been a crazy few months. I start feel like things are getting back to reality. And I hope that is the case. I've got my first vaccination and I'll get my next vaccination in just a few days. So ready to be done with that. Uh, but I'm excited about this episode, everybody. Um, the guest we have today is somebody I've known for a while. And by the way, another Canadian. Listen, we've had Irene on. She was from Toronto. We've had Vinay Bide. We've had Dr. Aptikachar. We've had Uncle Phil Walton. Uh, I know I'm missing some others. But we've had a bunch of Canadians on, but we have the best best Canadian on now, though he's been in the States for quite some time, and it's somebody I've known for quite a while, but I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Dr. Peter Schatz. Welcome, Dr. Schatz. How are you? Hey, thanks, and thanks for having me on. Glad to be here. My pleasure. No, I'm glad we were able to do it, and uh, listen, I'm getting my mojo back, like I was just talking about, and and so at least I didn't get you while I was in a rut. That would be horrible. You sound quite enthusiastic and well-rested, so welcome back (laughs) online. But a funny story for you, I uh, started a uh, studio for the Georgia Dental Association, and I nice. had this grand vision, and it's going to sound like your story, this grand vision of weekly update podcasts and monthly uh, guest podcasts, and this will be sort of Zoomcast or video cast. Sure. Out. And of course, we filmed two, and it's been two months, and they're still <laughs> processing. So I know your pain. I understand it. It's hard, especially at the beginning, getting your flow and how you're going to do it. And really the editing stuff and figuring that out, that takes a while. But but I didn't realize this. I did see a post you did for the first ever uh, GDA podcast episode. So who are you hosting that? Uh, it's uh, I would rather not. We have a <laughs> fantastic PR person at the Georgia Dental Association, Carol Galbraith. And uh, she's great. She's got great presence. She's got a great voice. She's got great motivation. So I would only bring down the game. So I'll let her <laughs> handle that. Well, that's my co-host, Blake McClellan, who, who comes and goes as he pleases, but he always just brings it down too. So, you know, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta have a weak link somewhere, right? Can't all be perfect. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Schatz, if you wouldn't mind, I'd actually like to get back to the GDA things, uh, GDA in just a minute, but can you kind of give everybody kind of like your story, right? Where you came right. from, how you got into dentistry, um, kind of your path at like high level view. Right. So if we go in the way back machine to why am I a dentist? Well, my dad was an OBGYN and always wanted me to go into the health sciences. Uh, but he had awful OBGYN time on calls, you know. Labor oh, yeah. delivery does not run by a clock. It does not. So <laughs> I'm like, I don't want medicine. So where can I do medicine, so to speak? Nine to five, no emergencies, evenings and weekends free, and all the stuff that everyone wants nowadays is what I was wanting back in the 80s. And uh, that's where dentistry came in. And then I thought, cool, we can do surgery. So I thought oral surgeons. So, of course, did a residency 
at a level one trauma center. And it was fun for about six weeks to do <laughs> fractures and gunshot wounds at 3 a.m. Yep. And then I said, all right, how can I do surgery without 3 a.m. call? And that's where perio came in. So from sinus lifts and bone grafts and implants and the garden variety, osteosurgery, periotherapy, gum grafts, and all that. I'm like, wow, I can have fun doing surgery with no emergencies and have a, a decent lifestyle. And that's where it all began. That's so, very similar to like a sales rep going for like spine or, or anything that's in the OR right. versus a dental sales rep. Same kind of idea. Yeah, <laughs> There's it's very exactly few. The same. Yeah. yeah. Very few last second implant surgeries, right? Yeah. No, not at all. And uh, so did my perio training. I grew up in Montreal, went to McGill University for undergrad, dental, and a residency, perio training at Louisiana State University down in New Orleans, and then decided that I was tired of shoveling snow and looked for <laughs> a great three-season city with a fantastic economy and airport, and Atlanta is where I've been since 95. Check all the boxes there except for the all summer, the right? boxes. Yeah, I sort of <laughs> misjudged how far the beach was. I said, oh, you know, back in the day, I had to buy a paper map and a ruler and figure out how to get from A to B. And I'm like, oh, I can get there after work on a Friday. And oh, no, you cannot. Well, you so, could. You're just not going to enjoy it very long. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're doing it now. So, you know, we're fortunate enough. Uh, my wife, Tammy, and I, you know, two professionals work in. So we're able to afford some luxuries in life. And one of them is a beach house and that's five hours south of here. And we can nice. get that after work on Fridays and spend two or three days a couple of times a month and really, you know, get the reward that we've been working for, for all these years. I bet that's been nice during COVID. Uh, you know, COVID was amazing. Uh, it shut down the world for the most part. And we spent some time at the beach for dentistry. I sort of had about six weeks of non-production. And then figured mm -hmm. it out and got back to work. Uh, but my kids who were, you know, budding professionals and uh, business people couldn't go to the office. And they're like, hey, mm -hmm. you have internet at the beach? And we're like, we sure do. So it's okay. We're going to spend four weeks at the beach working from home. And I'm like, it sucks. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's yeah. been great for them. So it's been a great escape from the pressure and stress of living in uh, COVID world. And where, oh, yeah. you know, where our escape is, is very rural with deer on the beach and still horseshoe crabs. And, oh, nice. you know, you could catch 20 pound redfish from the shore. And it's, so it's a very, very rural area. So as far as, you know, it's not Miami beach and uh, it's not Key West and it's not um, Palm beaches. So it's not like, where is it exactly? Or, Unless like you don't want people crowding the beach. I won't <laughs> want you to go. No, it's south of Tallahassee. It's a place called Alligator Point. And it's nice. very rural, 15 minutes from the closest convenience store. So it's that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Unless you get, you know, hungry in the middle of the night and you want to go down the street. That That's pretty uh, But other than that. Like, like everything else in life, plan ahead and you'll never want. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so you're, you're big. You've been educating for years, too. A lot yeah. on implant dentistry as well. I'm very aware of that. How did you get into that? Well, uh, let's see. I was uh, in business partnership with Lee Silverstein, who was served as faculty at the Medical College of Georgia, which is now, you know, Augusta State, mm -hmm. Georgia, and uh, came on as an associate and then a partner. And he was already in the teaching gig, both at this dental school and for, I'll call it for profit, you know, as a privateer. Sure. And he got me going with it. And we've done clinical research. We've published books, articles, all, you know, in the perio space. So implants, bone grafting, and periodontal therapy. And we've been fortunate enough to do a good job that we've had sponsors over the years that helped promote our courses and enabled us to do big things. And then, um, uh, as life changes, like everything else, I went out on my own now working for a con, uh, management company, still doing perio. And that has given me more time to hit the road before coronavirus and not worry about shutting the doors and keeping payroll going while I'm on the road teaching and uh, was able to expand the footprint internationally and still continue until coronavirus. Well, yeah, but that's <laughs> an interesting topic that always comes up too. It's, it's, the pros and cons of, of corporate dentistry, right, versus private practice. And so 
You spent how many years were you in private practice for? 21. 21 years. And then how long have you been? You're current with Dental uh, Care Alliance, correct? Correct. Dental Care Alliance. Great company to work for, for me as a specialist. They are out of my hair. They sort of, I'm doing what I did as a private practitioner in a management space, which has eliminated the management headache. So I don't have to worry about manpower, technology, rent, and employees, and all that kind of stuff. And build a practice, both internal with uh, inside referrals and external with outside referrals, still sending me business. So it's been fantastic for me because it allowed me to get some more leisure time and to be on the road. I did a lot of work over the last couple of years in uh, Southeast Asia and Central Asia, teaching what I've always taught, implants and surgery and bone grafting. And uh, there was no way I can go for two weeks at a stretch in private practice. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? You know, I I feel like the last 10 years, right. Prior like corporate dentistry just got, everybody was bagging on it. Right. It was growing quickly, but the reality is there's, there's a lot to managing a practice. Right. And if you wanted to do surgery and you wanted to just practice dentistry, let's say you don't always get to do just that. (laughs) If you, if you buy into practice, there's a lot of other stresses. So for like, we got a lot of younger dentists who listen to this as well. What would you say, uh, compare and contrast some of the, the pro- what are some of the positives about both that you experienced right. in your career? So I think especially as a new grad, and we see them coming out on a regular basis, DCA's got 300 some odd offices in 30 states. So it's it's got a big footprint. And we have a lot of docs coming out of dental school. And the biggest thing, even during coronavirus, is we can have a new grad come in and have a busy schedule on day one. Nice. No financial risk compared to building a de novo practice. And I, I need to I need to interrupt you real quick. Yeah. If you think as a new grad that you will walk into a de novo practice or even as an associate and just be slammed, that's not the way it works. <laughs> just so it you know. It is not. It is not. You've got to build your skill set, your communication skills, your patient base, and whoever you're going to go work for, if it's in a small group practice or a solo that you're transitioning into. They still have a paycheck that they need to take home. So very few practitioners have such a huge excess capacity that they need double the producers there right away. So it's all a matter of building up steam and developing a referral base for yourself from friends and schools and your own network to grow the practice. So that's great. And then you don't need to worry about anything other than developing yourself as a professional developing your skill set. You've everyone's heard the horror stories about, Oh, there's production quotas and materials and whatnot. And not to offend anyone, but I haven't seen that to be the case with where I'm working DCA or any of the other big modern uh, DSOs. I mean, we use Nobel product, Zimmer product. We use Strauman, BioHorizons, I mean, all the majors for implants, bone graft material, whichever brand or flavor I want. And that's not just me, but any of our practitioners within certain limits. If you want to use brand A and I want to use brand B, there's space for that. Um, The other thing is the labs are good if you figure out which labs do well, but that's the same as in private practice. A hundred percent. A great <laughs> removable lab will not do good implant overdentures and a great fixed prosthetic lab may not be able to do hybrids. And that's the same problem that you have in the DSO space. So it's not a unique thing where we're cutting corners. The ability for a DSO to succeed is all in the back office, supply chain management, central business office management, Mm -hmm. infrastructure management. That's where the cost savings come from primarily. The doctors make good money and probably right away make better money than the private practice doctors in the first month or two or three. By the end of the first year, you know, there's some parity there. But you get other advantages, and I'm not here to sell. I've been a private practitioner, business owner, and a DSO employee dentist. Um, I've got a 401k, good health care. I've got my practice covered. I've got CE given to me by the corporation. Nice. So that's great. Now, of course, 
if I have an issue with a certain employee and I'm in private practice, I can rework my workforce. In sure. VSO, you're the employee. And if you don't get along with a coworker, you've got to go to management. Or if you don't like the color of the paint on the walls, you can't repaint the place. If you don't like any facet of that company, it's not yours to change. You sort of have to adapt or uh, leave. So sure. you leave that control thing and dentists are control freaks. And for me, that <laughs> was heard that. probably that. the hardest part of going into a DSO is to give up certain levels of control. But for me, the advantages were far outweighing the disadvantages. But it allowed you to control your personal life though too. Oh, right? yeah. Absolutely. So there's that balance, right? Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, Cause you wouldn't probably, be able to travel. You wouldn't be, especially during COVID. And I think this yeah. highlighted some of the reasons like, we always talk about business ownership and we talk a lot about entrepreneurship in this podcast, but nobody saw COVID coming. Like I no, assumed uh, that there would be an economic downturn at some point when things were going really well, but I didn't see it coming this way. And so, you know, a lot of people, it actually accelerated a lot of the DSO being more DSOs and being more aggressive in acquiring more practices because you had some dentists and this isn't the case for everybody, but they just maybe didn't enjoy it. Maybe weren't great at it. And they maybe were going to lose their practice in five years anyways. Right. But this actually gave them a way to either sell their practice and still have employment. So yeah. it's uh, it's not always easy being a business owner. My wife is one. It can be very, very stressful. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, supply chain advantages in a DSO. Oh, yeah. I've you got, have buying power. I've got 300 offices that I'm buying for and I need N95s and gloves and gowns. Yep. We had the pockets to buy the stuff. Yeah. As a GP... I mean, everyone knew, and, uh, you know, I'm going to just drop some names, but, you know, the big three dental supply houses went on rationing. You couldn't buy more than six boxes of gloves a week, four boxes yep. of N95s a week, some stuff you just couldn't even get. And we were going to the manufacturers as a DSO and getting stuff within yeah. limits. So we all had to do a step back and punt, but, you know, we had statisticians on board and, uh, people from the logistics and supply chain industry that saw things like, hey, we're going to have a hole in hygiene. And we took our furloughed employees and offered them a uh, hourly job at a much reduced rate, but work from home and yeah. start calling patients for appointments in July. We were calling for October hygiene visits. That's a really cool move, by the way. Oh, you know, was, I, didn't, I didn't heard about that. Oh, I know. But so that's some of the stuff. So we were able to backfill our schedule as we got a handle on what coronavirus was and will be to a dental practice. So it's been fantastic because I didn't have to invent the wheel. There were people who were much higher skilled than me. But as a private practitioner, you know, it was my castle. It was my team. I can hire and set uh, payroll expectations top to bottom of the industry in my little business and uh, be able to build a culture that's Peter Schatz Incorporated and sure. DSO Incorporated. And so then you could be that standalone solo practitioner. Ultimately, you know, the turnover at five years is about two thirds of the docs and DSOs leave for private practice. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge space, you know, people want it. What are you going to do with the people who, you know, are um, low, medium, median income and need a place to get their teeth fixed? You know, they can go to, you know, a high end ritzy dental practice for a two thousand dollar crown or a DSO for a, you know, eight hundred dollar crown. Well, and to and, be fair, there's a lot of different shades. There's some high end, you know, group uh, yeah. practices and that line yeah. gets blurred. What's corporate oh, dentistry? What's everything's not. everything's blurry. I mean, I was incorporated as a solo practitioner, so I was a corporate practice. Yeah. We owned at one point four locations. Uh, so, they, you know, and I got a paycheck from the company. So, you know, but if you think about what's really employee dentist that works for a dental service organization, you know, you don't have that ability to make it your own. Sure. So would your advice be to, you know, Dennis deciding whether I want to try to do private practice, whether it's an associate or our buying a practice or join a DSO, which could be lots of variations of those. What would your advice be? Would it be, 
you know, do the research on each one, know it, know your, know thine own self, what you really want. I think it's know thyself. I mean, there are kids that I went to elementary school with and kindergarten that were cutting yards and washing cars in middle school and became business owners. Very, very entrepreneurial. And then we had the more cerebral kids growing up and, you know, it depends on your personality type. And, sure. uh, you know, most of the dentists coming out are female. And if you're going to want to get married and have kids, it's hard to stop your practice for a maternity leave when you want to have your kids in your 20s and early 30s. And that's when you're building your practice from zero. And how do you balance that? Sure. And, and many, many do. So I'm not saying that DSO is a women's space. So don't anyone go hate on me. But I'm saying if your lifestyle is such that you want to be a family person, then maybe business ownership isn't for you. But if you are that, I don't know, tiger business person who wants to go conquer the world and be famous and invent things and create things, then, you know, solo. And are okay with risk. Uh, (laughs) Lots and lots of risk. And that's fine. I mean, for me, I love risk. I thrive sure. on risk and thrive on deadlines, and that's my jam. And so it was great to go into private practice and do those things. And we acquired practices, you know, went from two locations to three locations to four locations as specialty referral perio. So, yeah. you know, privately held. And we had, what, over the years, four or five periodontists work for us over the years. So, there was certainly risk involved in that, but the rewards were it was mine. Sure. It was my creation. So again, you got to know who you are and what you want to do. And if you're not sure, then a DSO or an employee role, even in a private practice, say, you know, I'm just going to associate for a few years with, mm-hmm. you know, Dr. Smith's office on Main Street in a small town America. Go for it. And if you say, you know what, I need the big city, I want to be on, you know, Wall Street doing teeth for stockbrokers, then go do it. So again, it's what you want. And that's the best part of dentistry is you're not limited, you know, at all. No. And listen, when you see all the private equity money and stuff going in, it tells you one thing. Dentistry is a safe bet too, right? It's consistent as as hell. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the default rate on dental loans. And see, you know, school loans and practice loans is so small compared to the overall lo- loan portfolio spectrum. That's why PE private equity money loves dentists. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, some of the biggest DSOs are multi-billion-dollar entities. You know, yep, it's amazing. It's great. Oh, it really is. And there's not, there's still plenty of money flowing into the dental industry right now. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. No, I actually think just like when implants came out, there was this pent up need. It fit an answer to a problem that's always been there. And so there was this big rush in the 90s for singles and bridges and reconstructions. And now, just like the uh, LASIK eye thing, we're sort of backfilling the new caseload. But COVID put a pause on dental service requests. And Mm -hmm. so now we have this reservoir of unfilled dental needs that it's going to be, I'm very optimistic, and the numbers are showing it in our practice, that 2021 is going to be great. As far I would, as services. Yeah, my, my prediction was this. I, I, I said this back, I think it was like six months ago, maybe maybe longer. You know, right when we were getting into COVID and, and then and then we realized the shutdown was going to be longer than expected. I said, I actually believe, even though, you know, theoretically people have less money, right? People are hitting hard times, but people have been locked in their homes. They want to go out and they want to do the things they, they took for granted before. And part of that's smiling and feeling confident. And when you're forced to be at home, right? And now you have the option to go out and maybe you didn't before because you were ashamed of your teeth. Now you really want to go out there. So have you found that people, you're finding more people doing implants and more cosmetic services? Oh, yeah. And I think the real reason is they're not spending money on things like 
the two or three times a week you go to a restaurant for a hundred bucks or vacations and, that cost an obscene go. amount vacation. if you have kids my age. <laughs> I mean, you try and go purchase an ATV, an RV, um, you know, uh, any of these leisure craft, a jet ski brand new from oh, yeah. a dealer. There's no inventory nope. uh, on the higher end. I know a bunch of people just cause uh, North American headquarters for Porsche is in Atlanta. So I know a lot of the higher ups mm-hmm. as patients in the practice and they have no inventory. I mean, people wild? are finally buying the sports car they always wanted. And of course there's supply chain issues and reduced sure. production, but people are spending money and they're like, well, if I can't go to Europe for the family vacation, yep. I may as well get my ugly crooked teeth bleached, straightened, Invisaligned and some implants and invest in myself because that's a win guaranteed. No, hundred percent. That was my prediction. It just, and that was more just logic, right? Like I just assumed that's what would happen, but it's nice to hear that that is happening, right? That's good for everybody in the industry, right? Yeah, absolutely. But it's also valuable because you can help take somebody coming out of everybody's gone through a pretty rough time. You know, I'll say we've been very fortunate in my family, but a lot of people have gone through a really rough time and you can help them. That's what I always talk about. You know, People just come into the dental industry, right? Assistants, hygienists, new doctors. I'm like, I'm jealous because you guys get to play, you know, a part in changing people's lives. And I think that's now more so than ever before. Yeah. It's like that extreme makeover show that was on oh, like yeah. a decade ago. And, you know, smile rehab with sure. not just, you know, hybrids, which is my jam, but uh, veneers and crown oh, yeah. bridge and, you know, getting stuff turned around and, you know, changing lives. I did a, I mean, on the low end of things I did a, this afternoon, my last case was, I think a 30 year old kid who had issues with drug abuse and got Mm -hmm. meth mouth. And we took out all her teeth and she was missing about every other tooth in her smile. Good looking kid, but self-confidence issues. She's now wearing dentures because that's all she could afford. Sure. But she could not stop crying at the end of the appointment because we gave just her the, the aesthetics of dentures so, like, you, know, listen, the, you know the, the drawbacks of dentures real. man yeah. they can look gorgeous yeah. too but when you go from you know oh meth mouth yeah meth mouth to straight white teeth that you haven't had since you were in high school i mean that's huge just life-changing well it's especially good. when you have meth mouth like everybody kind of knows what that is now and, and it's and sometimes you see that and it actually could be your treatment for cancers things like that but but it's that there's a shame associated. I've had friends who've, who've gone through really difficult times like that. And it's, yeah. it's hard to hide that, right? It's embarrassing. And it's, uh, and like, even if they've changed who they are, you know, that's an aspect where they'll have to work to change as well. And, you know, what do you see happening with that? Like, let's, this is, this just popped in my head. You know, there's this debate going on when you, we're seeing more and more of these 30 something year olds who are having these issues, right. Yeah. And wanting to replace all their teeth because they're losing all their teeth. Now, I was at a, a CE program the other night and they were kind of debating this. Like, would you, uh, you know, recommend like a roundhouse kind of bridge approach on implants or kind of like the, the hybrid approach where you're, you know, removing a lot of bone because you need more space in that scenario? It depends on the patient's level of disease. So for me as a periodontist, as you, I usually get the blown out apical periodontitis patients where the Mm -hmm. bone loss is, you know, down to the bottom when they breathe in the teeth move inwards. And when they breathe out, they wiggle outwards, you know, so a hybrid is not, (laughs) it's not a hard sell to do a hybrid because they've lost that vertical component. They did that for you already. (laughs) Yeah. So I've got the prosthetic space to do the work. Sure. But the meth mouth where you have that height, a bone because you were able to get the roots out and you have about 80% of the jawbone left as a periodontist. I cringe when people take those oscillating saws and yeah. just go right across and you see this looks like a denture, but it was that poor soul's jawbone that they took yeah. off with their dentition intact. And I'm like, Oh no, I could do better. And that's where the zirconium fixed bridge, mm-hmm. uh, less space, interclusal space needed for those. And you can get a fantastic, long-lasting result either way. 
My yeah. only caveat with all of them and what's helped us survive these cases with people not used to taking care of those mouths is just yeah. if you're going to do one of those reconstructions, make sure you get those people a mouth guard. And that's not for them. It's for you to protect your wife. Well, A mouth guard and remind them this is their second chance at teeth. They will lose them if they do not take care of them like yeah. they didn't take care of their first. Exactly. Set. Right. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things because, I, you know, I'm a, I've been – over a thousand of those cases, I, I, you know, I'm a full arch nerd, but I've seen the downside to it too. And, and that's part of it. There has to be some accountability on their side to take care of it now. Um, and it's, uh, I've seen when it fails because when they fail, they're massive failures. And oh, my fear, awful. Yeah. And my fear is with the younger patients too, if they were going through addiction and they're 30, let's just say 30. Yeah. And sure, this could last the rest of their lives, right? Um, oh, they're going to always be an addict. It's just like, well, that's the problem. If they slip back into that for yeah. a few year period yeah. and then you've already reduced all the bone, then you, you know, what's left, you know, on the lower, you may not have anything and right. maybe you have to go to Zygos on the upper, you yeah. know, and, and that's mm -hmm. not a great option either, you know? So, well, there's only, I, I, you know, one of my <laughs> mentors back in the day and it's an awful thing, but it's always stuck in my head from dental school because not everyone deserves the teeth that God gave them. <laughs> and it's true. It's, I mean, I love the guy and I thought that was the harshest thing I've ever heard, but it's I really grew, harsh. But as I grew as a professional, I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's like somebody who's got an addiction. It's a mm -hmm. true disease, but if you don't control it, it's going to control you. And then you suffer the consequences. Family, yeah. finance, health, the whole shebang. So, you know, you try and coach them up and you become, you know, an advocate for them because you're going to change their smile in their life. And so you got to let them know the value. It's not McDental, this stuff. It ain't cheap. Yeah. I mean, was it mid 50s, depending on where you are? That's a good working number. For upper and lower. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I'd say upper huge, 50s. Really. Huge. Yeah. A huge, huge investment. And so hopefully that will scare them straight. You would hope, right? Like I'm really yeah. like fingers crossed yeah. on that. Cause there's so many cases with young people that I'm like, please, man, please yeah. <laughs> just take care of uh -huh. yourself like, this yeah. time. And you it. don't want to go back there, but you never know. Yeah. Well, let's change subjects for a day. Cause I am interested. We were talking about your, the podcast with the GDA. So how involved are you with the GDA, which is part of the uh -huh. ADA, correct? Correct. So the American Dental Association has a tripartite or three-level um, structure with national on top, and that's the mothership, so to speak, based out of Chicago. And then there's the subordinate state societies, and every state has one, Georgia Dental mm -hmm. Association and wherever. And then within each state, they break the states up into districts. And so they have the component society, which is that grassroots sure. incubator for leadership to grow and give a fellowship, so to speak, where you have connection like any other group. And uh, so you grow from there. And I've climbed the ladder over the last two and a half decades, I guess. I was involved in the first week in, den in private practice. I was going to a dental meeting for the Northwestern District Dental Society mm -hmm. in Georgia. And so I was a baby dentist at that point, had no idea where Cartersville was or what a Cartersville was. <laughs> it and was a lot smaller back then, too. <laughs> it was. There was no traffic. So getting there was easy. Oh, yeah. And um, 20, let's see, 95 to 26 year, years later, I was last year the president of the Northwestern District Dental Society. Nice. And so grew through all the chairs and worked myself around. And then at the state level, I've been uh, mostly on. Uh, finance committee over the years. I'm a delegate to our House of Delegates, which is where we do all of our politicking and legislative action and those kind of things. I've been involved with anything related to finance from um, the building and management of the building itself mm -hmm. to uh, affinity programs with vendors like a lender or a vendor of some product. Sure. And, you know, there's a, always a preferred vendor relationship in most associations. So I'm mm -hmm. on the review committee for that. The general finance committee, uh, we stood up an innovation task force during coronavirus. You know, yeah. am I going to die drilling a tooth? I am mean, that's I serious gonna consideration. Honestly. Drag, am I going to drag 
COVID home and kill my spouse, kids, dog, cat. I mean, we knew nothing. Oh, yeah. 12 months ago, that was yeah, absolutely literally. legitimate question. They were all legit. So we found forward thinkers. We had a CDC scientist on it, a virologist from nice. UGA. We had one of the deans from the Augusta Dental School, uh, plus some other forward-thinking doctors who weren't panicking. But, uh, for instance, one guy you may have heard of is Ryan Fulci, and he designed mm -hmm. a 3D-printed mask Yep, that you put the Roomba vacuum cleaner N95 filter in a square, and you look like Darth Vader. But oh, if so you, you get were a look cool, too. Guides, <laughs> if you were printing guides, and he made it freeware, right? Yeah. The design was put out, and people were printing that. We were printing swabs for the state for nasal swabs when you nice. could get a swab. And so we had to be the clearinghouse to distribute all of these wonderful ideas. And then even to the point where we contracted with Mercer University to test some of the N95s that early on were coming in from overseas. And it turned out some were gray market, some were fantastic oh, yeah. and perfect. And some, you may as well put your hand over your face and breathe through your fingers because that's about as efficient as they were. Listen, some of those, uh, listen, I know a couple of associations of different states of things, like they all pulled money. They thought they were getting from a reliable source and they did not. And they uh, we not had get their money back. <laughs> we had a Connex box, you know, one of those transoceanic shipment yeah. boxes of N95s that we couldn't use. Oh my God. Wow. Uh, but on the other side, we were trying to purchase raw material, mm. uh, not inside GDA, but with another adventurer that mm -hmm. I was getting into, to start manufacturing gowns and masks. And anything yeah. of that was either retained in port at the originating country, and so the government can hold it for their own personal needs, yep. or were, I'll say it, absconded by the American government to go into the national stockpile. Yep. And I supported it. You know, I think, you know, the greater good always won out in my mind. And was I pissed off that, you know, some great masks were now in the national stockpile that I bought for Uncle Sam. But again, it was, you know, I stocked up on rice and beans. And, yeah, you know, <laughs> me too. I, I mean, <laughs> when they ran out of meat and you started seeing beef hearts and oxtails showing up at the local Publix, and I'm not in a Caribbean uh, <laughs> immigrant neighborhood where that's common food items. I'm like, oh no, we've got the food the toilet shortage. paper shortage was the yeah. freaked me out the most. I'm like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, so fortunately, we had uh, laughed about it. We live on a creek behind our house, and I there told my go. wife, I said, as long as we have running water, I'm good. We can clean ourselves in the shower, and if the water pressure goes off, we'll go in the creek and clean ourselves. Like <laughs> yeah. old days. I bet bidet okay. sales went out the roof. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Like for real. But I wish I had, had a Jamie to, like Joe Rogan does to Google that. Yeah. But like, you know, but as I told my <laughs> wife, I said, I've seen many a zombie movie that started exactly like this. Yeah. But you I know, never we, thought about toilet paper, though. That was just for no. Me. <laughs> uh, toilet paper was an interesting animal. If you dive into it, one of the early signs was horrible diarrhea. And oh, so yeah. Sales went up because people were really sick and we didn't know who was sick. And we thought if you were in the hospital, you had COVID, but there were plenty of, you know, mildly symptomatic people. Part of it was like, kind of like a bank run, right? Like you see somebody oh. go and you're like, oh, you're yeah. like, oh there's only a couple yeah. left. And what yeah. I figured out was later was actually, they just repl replenish those all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, toilet paper, because they can't stock that many because how large a space it takes up. It's not like right. cans of beans. You can have way more cans of beans you can a 40 yeah. pack of toilet paper. So part of that was the situation. And then you had the, well, they couldn't produce them anymore. So right. yeah, it's, you know, it, it's so interesting you had, to think if something like this happened again, how it would you would hope that we handled it differently? I just, it would it. I mean, a little faith. I told in that, my unfortunately. Wife, my, <laughs> my worst fear was food insecurity. Yeah. When the cities wouldn't be able to feed their residents. Yeah. That's when societal breakdown was going to happen in my yeah. brain. And I was worried about that. And that's when I said, you know, we'll just 
relocate to the beach and let the cities fight it out, of course. Yeah, we had a Cody Everyone Wyoming game plan if we had yeah. to. <laughs> but so did everyone else, right? So right. all of a sudden you're going to have squatters. So again, like I said, I've seen many of zombie movies that start this way in the breakdown of society. Well, fortunately, it hadn't happened anywhere on the planet. So kudos to humanity. We're not as awful as you would think we are if you were to <laughs> Well, I apologize. My ADA or AD, my ADHD took us off track there. But yeah. I'm going to ask you this: you, you're you've been involved in so much education, uh, owning yeah. practice, right? Over the yeah. years, um, you've gone to corporate dentistry. Yeah. But throughout the whole time, you've been involved in you know different societies and taking time to do that. Yeah. Why is that? Because I notice a lot of younger dentists have regardless of the society, you don't see it as much. It's like more creating those groups on Instagram or things like that. Uh, Well, what was your why and what would you recommend now? Well, so my why is because I love being around people and I like doing a lot of different things. I'm uh, involved with the civil air patrol in Georgia, Uh, you know, deputy commander for one of the squadrons. I'm director of operations for Northwest Georgia. Nice. Um, It's a, for me, it's a, I guess the service bug, you know, I want to serve society, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's where teaching at the medical college of Georgia, when I did that or donated time at the Ben Macell dental clinic. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't have when I was in my twenties and thirties was immediate access to the planet through social media. It didn't exist. Sure. So for me to get dental information, I had to read a journal or go to a meeting. And now that whole industry has gone on its head because now with Instagram, Snapchat, and whatever social media platform there is, you've got immediate access to peers and say, you know, put up an x-ray or picture. How would you handle this? Mm -hmm. And the on-demand expectation of the newer... I'll call it the millennial dentist and beyond, but I hate to put labels on people, but the people who grew up with technology in their hands when they were having dinner with their parents at a restaurant, right? I had crayons or a piece of paper or, you know, I, you know, played with my forks or whatnot. By the way, I'm guilty. I give my kids a phone, especially when they were like three, watch this video. So so when they're born with it, they expect, you know, if I roll over at 2 a.m. Yeah. And I'm up because I'm just up. I can go online and do an hour of CE. I can yeah. catch up with my friends around the world. So the connectivity in humanity has changed. You know, NASA conquered space. Google conquered the internet. And Facebook yeah. conquered humanity, right? Yeah. And that's sort of the working phraseology. For better or worse. For better well, or worse. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it is. And it, so it doesn't matter. It yep. just you can't undo it and there's no need to. I think it's for all the bad out there, it's connected people. Tons of good too. planet. So to say, Hey, I have to go to a dental meeting in Cartersville. All my kids are learning to crawl or eat with a spoon, but I put on a suit and tie and got in a car and drove two hours for a meeting because that's how I connected with my profession. Now I, if I was, you know, young me, I could pick up my phone, videotape my kid, get a couple of Instagram answers about a complicated case at work (laughs) and not miss a beat, right? So it's a different culture of the connectivity. And that's why you see the new people not joining organized dentistry as rapidly, getting as involved because they expect to have that as an addition to their life and not be the central portion of their life. So They want to raise their kids, be at the softball fields. And so they can get CE when it's convenient to them. They can get their answers immediately when it's convenient to them, wherever, whenever, on demand. And so that's the change in my mind. Well, is the ADA um, or GDA or any of the societies or associations, have you noticed them making, you know, I've, I've heard them talking about efforts, but what kind of changes have they made to kind of meet in the middle there? Right. Oh my God. So I've had, and it falls under diversity and inclusion, right? Mm-hmm. How to meet different people. And it's not 
man, woman, black, white, or whatever color sure. your skin is. It's different people and how to include them. And I've got what I was just talking about this last night. I think 22 hours of CE on DNI stuff, diversity inclusion mm-hmm. at, from the air force, from the Georgia dental association. And most importantly, from the American dental association, we see the numbers and I'll put on my ADA hat. Now we see as an association that there's a drop off that looks like Niagara Falls when sure. you look at the age distribution of active members. And even it was more like 36, 37 yeah. years old right there. And even more importantly, in leadership positions. Yeah. How do you do it? Now, part of it is you can't graduate dental school and say, I want to be a trustee for the ADA, the sure. Georgia Dental Association, or any other large corporation. You need to get some miles on you and understand the issues. But the organizations have to understand the new dentist, the younger dentist issues as mm-hmm. well. And it's an active and very uh, intentional process to meet them and go to them. And so we are going to our membership. Uh, when I started going to dental meetings in the mid nineties, it was what you expected. Gray haired, old white men. And that's <laughs> yep. who ran the show that's because right. they were at that time in their life where they're dialing back on their kids are grown practice. They're just coasting through it because it runs on its own. Sure. And now they have time to give back to the profession on the front end of your career. You're, buying a house and raising a family and going through all the schools and sports and things. And you really don't have time or the institutional knowledge, but the association has to come to you. And we are. How how are you guys doing that? So we have, for instance, the 10 under 10, the ADA recognizes 10 people in practice under 10 years and grows them as future leaders. And this is a national Very thing. cool. Uh, the Smile Con is the new name for the American Dental Association annual meeting. And it's we hired outside consulting firms, spent lots of money and lots of man hours redesigning the meeting to be more what people want, where it was, you know, 90% CE and 10% other things, including exhibit hall and sure. cocktail mixers. Now it's rebalanced. We've dialed back the amount of CE given and the caliber of CE given as we, you know, we ratchet it up to best of the best. And you'll see that when we publish who's speaking this year and it's, it's an all-star list. I mean, think about pro bowl or, um, you know, the all-star games of whatever sure. professional sports we're, Picking, I mean, honestly, the best of the best. So uh, making we, it fun too, <laughs> you uh, know. It, well, it's uh, learn, play, and uh, socialize kind of thing, and it's uh, it's all about the experience. All right, that's and it. And so it's meet, it's connect, it's everything you want. So the three words are you know meet, play, learn. Yep. And that's, the balance, you know, we had the bar graphs and the outside consultant says, no one's going to come to this boring dental meeting to get groaned <laughs> at. And so even the people lecturing are going to give a new and unique lecture. So nice. it's not going to be a dark room with PowerPoints and dark slides. We said, if you can't meet a certain goal, and I cannot tell you what that is, because that's sort of what sure. we're working on. But if you go to Vegas and we are meeting in person and that's the plan, unless something really bad happens. Very cool. Um, no one. And I, well, I'll just throw it a name like Gordon Christensen. We're like, Gordon, you do the same thing at every meeting and everyone loves you. <laughs> yeah, Give me true. something else. And he said, OK. And so like Gordon Christensen is going to give us something new. Nice. And everyone's going to give us. And we signed an exclusivity contract that they cannot use that lecture anywhere else oh nice so like an original uh, lecture just for this you know then you make it on demand it's the one place like yeah. i love that and you by the way fomo is you know what FOMO oh yeah is? you don't want to miss out baby no exactly so and then we've done uh redesign the exhibit hall it is not rows and rows of good because as uh, a vendor that sucks oh it's awful it <laughs> you sucks. know like 
it's so like, if you go to the SmileCon website, smilecon.com or .org, um, and look at the floor plan, I mean, it's out there for you to see how it's different. We're having meeting when, areas. When is this coming up? When's the meeting <laughs> coming up? Be, so the ADA meetings in Las Vegas at the mm-hmm. Mandalay Bay, which is fantastic. It's 187 oh, yeah. days away. And so it's October 11th through 13th. All right. All right. I'm putting that on my calendar because I got to check this thing out. To be honest be with different. you. Well, that's the what closest, I'm excited to see. Like the closest thing I could think of would be, oh man, who does the big pizzazz trade show? It's their own company. Uh, who owns Astra? Uh, oh, Dense Buy. Yeah, uh, Sarah Spy. World or whatever. Yeah, yeah, they Serona do a good job World. of that. Serona World. Right. That's it. It's a different meeting, right? Now they have white linen plated meals i've been to those and then they have big bands and they and all sorts of they stuff. got yeah. headliners but understand that's commercial of course okay? so if you dial out the raw 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 corporate thing and they do i mean i told everyone at because i'm involved with the annual meeting planning at the ada level i said we gotta set the standard to be like dense by serona world yeah. So that people want to come. And I mean, to go to Dense Fly, unless you bought new equipment, you're paying thousands of dollars to go to this meeting. Oh, yeah. Right. And so we've got to offer something. And there, it's a young crowd. It's a really young and diverse crowd. And everyone's jazzed to be there. I said, that's what we've got to become. And it's not my invention, but that was sort of the bar. And we hired a great consulting company that did some good work for us. And, uh, you know, so we've re-engineered the entire- Are you going to have podcasts there? <laughs> um, uh, we are. At least one, right? The GDA uh, one, or, or the ADA stuff. podcast. No, 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 no. We're going to have stuff there. And again, I can't give away all the steak and potatoes. Well, I, I got to ask, you know. No, no, but there will be. I mean, there's going to be cool. some stuff there that- uh, Were you at the Hinman Dental meeting? I did not go this year. This first year I haven't right. been in- 14 years. Right. So this is their, it was in person, which was wonderful to go back to. And I'll talk about that in just a moment, but I had to talk to, cause I'm also involved at the Hinman for many, mm-hmm. many years from day one, you know, and I called the, over the general chairman. I said, working for the ADA now, which is me. I said, I'm going to tell you that some of the stuff I'm seeing here is what we're planning to do. So good on you for figuring it out, but understand we've already contracted people. So don't think we're copying you in October. <laughs> I said, good they call. Have, good call. Some, though, some, of, the stuff, some of the stuff that you see, it's like, why haven't we done that before? And so there'll be good stuff. So there's going to be in person. There is going to be a little bit of a uh, uh, <clears throat> streaming component because we know not everyone wants to travel. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, hybrid type meetings are going to be a part of our lives forever. Sure. Uh, but for the American Dental Association, we had to bring in an in-person meeting. It's in our mandate, in our constitution and bylaws. And so we have to make something that people will want to go to. And I, and I think I think the demand will be back. To be honest yeah. with you, I think, every you know, from people I've talked to, surveys I've seen, people are ready. They just yeah. are. They miss they people. Are. So I was at the Hinman and, you know, they cut out about at least half of the chairs out of each lecture hall, yep. masks mandatory, um, social distancing, and everyone was having a great time, honestly. Everyone oh, yeah, because you're relaxed. out of the house. You actually get to talk yeah. to other you people. For me, people. other adults. Humans. Humans. Like, Humans. Wow. Yeah. So, but, and some people scooted their chairs next to each other and some of them scooted their chairs away from everybody. Sure. But there were no COVID cops in the building, you know, Hey, you know, with a six inch ruler or a six foot ruler. So it was, we're all professionals and everyone behaved well and enjoyed it. And I thought the Hinman did a great job for the first in-person meeting after COVID that I've been to kudos to them. That yeah, and that's a that was my first dental meeting ever. My first day out of training with Meisinger, I literally drove back, and it was during the Henman, and they just sent me right to the show. Right. <laughs> I was like, "That's what I was born into dental and into." Yeah, the Hedman no, meeting. that is, I mean, that's a gold standard show. Oh yeah, I mean, they, they've got it down to a science, and they're really good. 
No, for sure. Well, before we wrap this, I got to commend you, by the way, you're talking about like what the ADA is doing, what the GDA is doing to reach out to younger people and kind of meet them where they are, where their attention is, whether it be social media and a lot of content creation. And before we end it, I want to say like, I've been watching like part of this, you know, I I'd reached out to you because the last couple of years I've been paying attention, you know, on social media. And then like, wow, I didn't expect Dr. Schatz to be doing videos like patient facing videos. And then all of a sudden I see you on the freaking news, by the way, which is like, yeah. hey, it's Dr. Schatz. <laughs> yeah. And then, As chair yeah. of the Innovation Committee, I had some wonderful opportunities to get on TV, NPR radio, Associated Press. I mean, I had some wonderful opportunities given to me by the Georgia Dental Association that went, you know, local, regional, national. Yeah. That were great. You did some- really well, by the way. It's not easy. It's not easy. But again, I've been on stage for years. Sure. Uh, talking, and the I guess the biggest learning was going out to, you know, Central Europe, Asia, and yep. Southeast Asia, and just showing up with translators and all that. And you get to become, you know, a better trade craft is all I can Yeah. Say. Well, let me ask you this. What's more difficult? Because for you now on the stage, it's no big deal. You've done it for so long. But when you started out, like, that can be overwhelming for some people. Yeah. But what I've always found more difficult is when there's no audience there and a camera in front of you. Oh, to me, that's I'll way harder. Say, even though I'm online with you right now, I disdain Zoom. And I've got about four or five Zoom calls a week for yeah. the last year. Yeah. For, what, for all the organizations I'm involved with, hate it. It's, uh, it's and, a, it's a love hate for thing for me too. I've become very comfortable with it and it's done well for me in my career because I got onto it early, but yeah, it is yeah. a pain in the ass for, especially when there's a it, bunch of people on it. it just sucks. Well, what you can't do is you don't get for me, the human connection. I was never uh, yeah. a virtual reality person, be it Dungeons and Dragons never did it for me. I liked sports. Um, gaming online i've never done call of sure. duty i would go out and ride motorcycles with friends um, nice so it's those kind of things so i was more a full contact sport kind yeah. of person and not a cerebral online but it's there but it also didn't exist so it, you know sure it's not what i grew up with but we have to go to the members and the georgia dental association is doing it our leadership is the pipeline to the national level. So at the local level, like in the district level, leadership is young and vibrant and diverse. But it takes time for that pipeline to backfill the state level, which then grows leaders for the national level. So it's going to take some time, but everyone just know, we know we're working on it and if we haven't reached out to you or reach you in the right way, then I'm sure Shane will be able to Oh yeah. point you in my direction and you can find me and yell at me and tell me <laughs> how I'm doing it wrong and well, how I'm doing it better. Don't stick on me, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just going to be the filter and just send them my okay. way. Uh, yeah, I'll be like, you be nice. You be yeah, nice, I'll right? Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, I would say this though. I, I think one thing that, uh, you know, all the younger people like out there about social media and they always talk about community in, in a sense is you haven't really, if you haven't been involved in the associations, that's really where that started. And then you got used to the online and that's what you grew up with. But I would say there's so much experience out there, right? For somebody like you, Dr. Schatz, who've been doing How long have you been practicing now? 1995. Since 1995, right? So you can do the math. That's 20, almost 26 years yeah, yeah. right there. Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty good for a dumb guy. Yeah, not right? bad. Yeah, I, that's pretty good for me. Um, but there's so much that he can share with you, and and there's more of him there, right? Yeah. And so no there's matter better what, than me out there. Yes. Well, that's yeah. kind of you to say, but <laughs> um, I just think you should interact with that and and take on leadership roles and service roles because it is extremely rewarding, regardless of whether you're in dentistry or you're in sales. Like I give back all the time. Like I make it a mission now, and I wish I had started even younger. Right. Um, you don't have to be experienced for 20, 30 years to do that. Start learning now, getting involved and giving back. And it's super rewarding. Uh, yeah, short get, noticed. get noticed. Oh, yeah. You like attention? We're looking for people. Yeah. yeah. If you, this is like going to the bar and being the, you know, being the only guy there in a room full of ladies, if that's what your thing is, right? Like it's a, it's a good time if you want to be in a leadership role is what yeah, I would say. Absolutely. 
I probably phrased that horribly, but that's all right. That's perfect. That's all right. Yeah. You just talk to HR <laughs> at the end of this call, would you? <laughs> I am the HR department on this podcast. So <laughs> we're good. Uh, but Dr. Schatz, thank you so much for joining, uh, joining the podcast. It's been almost an hour already and it flew by. Um, so I always enjoy speaking with you and, and, uh, again, the ADA smile con meeting. I like what you did there. Uh, like comic con is October yeah. 11th, through the 13th, correct? Yep. Mandalay Bay, Las Vegas. And it's going to be a fun meeting. Honestly, I, I wrote it down. I'm going to actually, I'm going to be there and I'm not a huge Vegas fan. Cause I almost didn't survive a couple of times. But yeah, I'm going to take the risk. Kind of, there's different types this. of Vegas. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm much older now, though. So yeah. it will probably be a little more mild now. But again, <laughs> thanks so much for your time tonight. Hey, and I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Anytime. Well, thanks so much. And guys, we'll catch you on the next All In Podcast. Thanks for listening to the All In Podcast. See you next time.